Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar tonight, Cancer, Chronic Illness, and Intimacy. We are so glad you're here. We want this to be as interactive as possible, and Dr. Rubin and our panel would love to take your questions. The only thing we ask is that they are general and non specific as we cannot give any medical advice. You will see on the right hand side of your screen there is a questions pane and we encourage you to use that as much as you want starting whenever you want. So we have a little disclaimer that obviously of course we cannot offer medical advice and then we want to thank our partners tonight. A couple takes on MS, Dan and Jennifer Dickman, MS for MS, Roll Call Wheelchair Dance, and Zero Us To Prostate Cancer Support Groups. Um, so I am so thrilled to be here. I am just so grateful to our hosts and um, um, the sponsors of this event. You know, this is the second event we've done together, and the first one just had me uh, completely excited um, to come back for more and, and talk to you all about the things that I know. And I will tell you, there is so much I don't know. Um, there is so much doctors in general don't know, and we do the best that we can. And we are set up in a really broken medical system where we often only get 10 minutes um, and uh, we're supposed to deal with cancer and chronic illness and all these really horrible things that sex never really comes up. Intimacy never really comes up. Those real, you know, come to Jesus conversations of how is it going and how can we optimize your health? It really, it doesn't happen very often and it should happen a whole lot more because what is, you know, what is the point of keeping you alive as long as possible? What is the point is we, we don't want you to be in pain. We want you to stay alive as long as possible. And we want you to have meaningful, deep, wonderful, intimate relationships and, and interaction. That could be with any family members. It can be with loved ones. It can be with children. And, and what can we do to enhance that any way possible? We don't spend enough time talking about that. And so um, I don't have all the answers tonight. I certainly don't. But But what I do have is I care and I want to listen and I want to hear and my whole um, my whole model is really just to listen to people's stories and then to take the biology that we know and try to figure it out and say how can we optimize your biology to work the best for you possible and I'm a big believer in that biopsychosocial approach is how can we really just make things work as best as possible and get you love you know having some quality of life because quality of life is so so important. So um, that is my Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook handles. Um, I would love for you to follow along. I do a lot of advocacy work and yelling uh, work for sexual medicine. Um, uh, I just taught before this, I just taught sex ed for two hours to my old high school, which was just so much fun. And a lot of these slides are similar ones that I used um, with that group. Um, and so, like I said, it, it's really biology, right? How can we get biology um, to work for us and how can we get your biology to make sense and and we don't do enough educating as doctors we don't do enough of explaining well this is how your chronic disease has affected your penis or this is how your nerve issues in your spine have affected your vulva and this is why you can't sit this is why you can't wipe this is why it's painful this is why your arousal doesn't feel as good orgasm is super delayed or absent altogether or what is the difference between erection ejaculation orgasm and libido um, why is everything gone to hell after 50 in menopause and and really I like to just help explain all of that and then also come up with solutions of how we can optimize and make things better if we can make anything better and um, I don't know about you you know I said I just taught sex ed for my high school um, this is how I learned it I actually still remember the middle school gym teacher who taught me sex ed and the only thing I remember about that class is actually the word smegma, which if any of you know what smegma is, it's the oils and skin cells that form underneath a foreskin. Um, and uh, that's all I remember, which is kind of funny because then I became a urologist with my, my day job. And um, I actually do research right now on smegma of the clitoris. And so it's a little bit interesting uh, how it's all come full circle. But this is how I learned sex ed. This is how many of you learn sex ed. In fact, I posted to Twitter just yesterday a, a, a tweet telling people I was going to teach sex ed. And 
saying, what do you remember and what do you wish you knew? And it went viral. I mean, we have 100,000 impressions. 100,000 people have seen that tweet and have commented um, about how they wish they learned more about consent and pleasure and they wish they knew where the clitoris was. They wish someone showed them where the clitoris was and they wish, you know, they knew that there were different ways to have sex and have pleasure and, and so many amazing comments. I, I never expected it to kind of blow up the way that it has. So if you are curious, you should check out that Twitter thread because I certainly learned a lot. And I think we do a total disservice by having private parts, right? By calling them private parts, by making them really uncomfortable to talk about, to think about, to um, uh, even have problems with. Because when things go wrong, who do you go see? Who do you go talk to, right? I said to the high school students today, I said, man, you can easily have, um, you know, talk about your broken arm or your broken leg, but you can't talk about your broken penis. You can't talk about your broken vulva and, and you can't even say vulva, everyone calls it a vagina and mostly it's the vulva that breaks and no one can talk about it. And so we've done a problem, we've done a bad thing by calling them private parts and making them private to ourselves, private to our doctors, private to our partners. Um, and, and I think we have a lot of work to do um, there. Um, I'm a big believer in that we have to joke and we have to have a sense of humor about these things. Um, you know, anyone who becomes a urologist has to be kind of funny. Uh, it's a rule. They actually give us a humor. No, they don't give us a humor test, but they should. Um, and, and sex is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be enjoyable. You know, it, it can get really stressful if you're trying to make a baby. And I'm not talking about fertility and making babies because, frankly, I don't really want the two babies that I have right now. Um, but but we have to talk about sex in, in a pleasure kind of way. Um, and it's about adult playtime. How do we have fun? How do we have fun with ourselves? How do we have fun with our partners? What gives us joy? For some people, that's orgasms. For some people, it's eating ice cream. For some people, it's going skeet shooting or, you know, something like that. So you have to find the things that give you pleasure and do more of them. But again, with these private parts, right, we, we go to the doctor and, and we hide behind a sheet or we keep you very covered or, oh my gosh, I'll only do the penis exam if absolutely necessary. We try to keep you modest. And it doesn't really, it's, it's, it's not the right thing necessarily, right? We're not mechanics looking under a hood. What do you learn about your own body when you are hidden from it, you know, at the doctor's office? And, and it goes for all genders and all genitalia. We don't really spend enough time teaching you about how your plumbing works. And so when it doesn't work, you know, if it's normal, everyone has problems and nobody knows anything. So what do we do when things go like wrong, right? Where any chronic illness, any illness, anything, pregnancy, for goodness sake, anything can alter, you know, what you're used to or what you remember. And we don't even talk about normal. So how much more difficult does it become when you have abnormal, when you have cancer, when you have um, lupus, when you have um, you know, MS, something like that, and, and the whole body changes. And what doctor do you go see? Because your MS doctor is probably not talking to you about sexual function, but they should be, right? Because sex is not just a genital problem. It's not just a urology problem. It's not just a mental health problem. We have to get better about um, you know, comprehensive sex education. It has to be more than just don't get pregnant and don't get an STD. But when we're teaching people about sex is how do you talk about it? How do you have healthy relationships? How do you empower people and get them comfortable with body image and safety and um, just being able to speak up for themselves and being able to um, know how to talk about things when things are not going, you know, as planned. Um, and again, like I said, it, I'm a big believer in this biopsychosocial model, right? This idea that we are complicated individuals and there's of course a lot of psychosocial that goes in with uh, sexual health, um, you know, um, your past, your history, your partners, your cultural upbringing, your trauma history, all of that really matters. But your biology matters in my opinion, just as much. And so, what I see as a, as a urologist and, and, and doing all sexual medicine is, you know, I have much less convincing to do for my penis owners, for the men out there that, that, um, that they're bio, that they're really, there's a lot of biology. Sometimes I have to spend a little more time on that psychosocial piece and really encourage them to kind of focus on psychosocial, but on the female side, gosh, women are gaslighted into thinking that it's all psychosocial, that everything that it goes on with sexual health is psychosocial. And I'm here to tell you that's not true either. And we are all biopsychosocial beings and your biology plays into this, um, plays very much into sexual health. 
Um, and a 10 minute doctor visit, it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough for it to talk about your chronic illness. It's not enough to get to the bottom of new treatment options. And it's certainly not enough to fully get to know you, your goals, your relationships, what you want out of everything. And so um, it's really important that you build, that you think of yourself as a puzzle piece. Um, and you realize that not there's not going to be one doctor, one provider, one mental health care provider that, or, or physician or physical therapist. There's not going to be one person who does it all, or who fixes everything, who magically makes everything better. That person does not exist. And so you have to think of yourself a little bit like a puzzle piece. And with that puzzle piece, you have to add and subtract and change team members and really see that as, okay, I am a, sec I am a quality, I, I care about my quality of life. And so what what tools do I need to add into my toolbox to optimize my quality of life? And, and sometimes it's even just mind shift changes. And what is the goal of sex? If I'm not trying to make babies, what is the goal? If it's pleasure, then it shouldn't be that orgasm is the only thing that gives you success, right? Maybe it's just being alive with your partner or being alive with yourself and a device or just thinking of a nice thought, right? It's, it's kind of changing your mindset, but really figuring out who belongs on your team. And so this is the teams that I often work with, um, and I always work in teams. I can't do anything by myself. Uh, maybe I didn't do that well in med school or something like that, but I'm a big believer that I cannot solve all the problems. And so I re rely very, very deeply on my uh, different partners. And so that it may be me, a sexual medicine doctor, it may be a pelvic floor physical therapist, which hopefully we'll talk more about in the Q&A as really one of the most underutilized things in the world when you have any kind of pelvic health condition or sexual complaint problems. If you have urinary frequency, urgency, leakage, prolapse, pelvic pain, uh, testicular pain, back pain, penis pain, uh, perineal pain, uh, sciatica, any of those things um, is often a musculoskeletal problem. Sometimes in addition to other problems like hormone problems, muscle problems, and nerve problems, but there are a lot of musculoskeletal problems that exist. And uh, sex therapy. Sex therapists are, um, gosh, nobody's so good at sex, they can't get better. Everyone needs a sex therapist. Everyone can get better taking, you know, an hour out of their day with themselves or with them and their partner and just saying, how do we get better about talking about sex and intimacy, right? If you say, honey, that move you've been doing for 30 years, it just doesn't work anymore, or it just doesn't feel as good. It's hard to say that to your partner of 30 years. And sometimes having a coach in the room um, kind of guide you through that can be really, really helpful. And so how do we find doctors like me or, or providers that can help with these things? So I, I put a few tools on here that maybe are going to be helpful for you. And, and again, happy to answer any questions as we go. Sorry for the uh, all the messy, um, um, you know, getting on here. So ISWISH, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, ISWISH, don't say that five times fast, it's too challenging. Um, ISWISH is a wonderful organization that is just devoted to women's sexual health and, and furthering the science and, and education around it, you can find a provider. So uh, many of my friends are on this list um, and we certainly can help you. This is sort of on the women's side. Um, on the male side, um, SMSNA, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America, they also have a find a provider. Now I, I, I warn you, I'm on, on all of these lists if you are in the DC area. Um, and then the North American Menopause Society can be a great resource as well. Um, or to find if you do are concerned about a hormone issue, um, then, then definitely um, finding a practitioner who is a menopause specialist is really good. So, so this is where you can really find a provider for the medical side of things. Now, um, it's separated into male and female, but there are many of us who are um, very happy to see a gender non-binary or transgender patients, and certainly um, there are lots of options for there as well. For pelvic floor physical therapists, there are a number of different websites that you can go to. This is one of my favorites right now, pelvicguru.com. Um, the woman who runs it is just really doing remarkable things for the world. And it really is helpful because you can search from someone who sees pelvic pain, women's health, sexual health, uh, men's health, and you can find providers because not all physical therapists are created equal. They haven't all been to the same, just like not all urologists are created equal um, uh, and not all gynecologists are created equal. So you want to see someone who actually has an interest in this type of stuff, who is actually going to take the time. Sometimes you can't do it all in one visit, but maybe if it, they take insurance and you can spend it's the 10 minute visit, schedule two or three, right? Think, okay, we're going to kind of get to know each other. And I want to schedule two or three visits to, to really work with this person. And then I'm a big believer, as I said, in mental health care. I believe everyone benefits from mental health care. Everyone, 
everyone benefits um, because if your brain is relaxed, if your brain is healthy, um, you can it, you can it, you can have pleasure. You can think about pleasure. You can want pleasure. And so, um, very good ways to find sex therapists. There's the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, or ASEC. They have a nice find a provider. And there's a great website uh, called psychologytoday.com. If you've never heard of it, it's kind of like Yelp for therapists. You just type in your zip code, you type in your insurance, um, and you look, you say, oh, I want a, I want someone who deals with anxiety and couples, or I want someone who does sex therapy. And, 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 and it'll pop up different profiles so you can kind of act like you're online dating uh, and see people who seem like they would be a good fit. And, and when it comes to mental health care, you all know this just as much as I do. I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir. You got to find a good fit for goodness sake. You got to find someone who really um, you can work with and really understands you and knows you and you can feel really comfortable with. So um, I don't have a, a, a ton more to say. I'm going to go through a few more slides because I just want to explain how I do this and, and there's no magic to it. I am not a, a superhuman. I'm not smarter than anybody else, but I ask right? Like that's my whole thing. I just ask because nobody else will. I ask about libido. I ask about orgasm. I ask about pain. I ask about trauma. I ask about um, how you were raised and what you think about sex and what kind of sex do you want to be having, right? And and what would, what are your goals? What would make you happy? Um, what are, you know, if I can really get to know you and get to know what it is you want, well, then we can work together to figure out what do we need to do to get you there. And I'm not perfect. I have plenty of patients who I have not quote unquote cured or fixed, but they keep coming back because they know that I'm going to keep coming up with new ideas. And when I run out of ideas, and sometimes I do run out of ideas, um, I have a lot of friends and, and I love my friends and my friends love me. And I would like to send people to my friends or to other specialists and people who, who I know. So I ask questions about being sexually active. I make it normal that many people with diabetes have decreased sensation in their penis, or 50% of 50 year olds have erectile dysfunction. Or if you're eight years past menopause, you have an 88% chance of having sexual problems. And this is why, and this is what happens to the body. Um, I'm a listener, uh, it, which is, uh, uh, my husband doesn't agree with me, unfortunately, but uh, I think because I listen so much at work, I, uh, I don't have the best listening ears at home, um, but I listen. I really, really try to take time. I try to not interrupt. I try to let you tell me your story in long form so that I can really help be that detective to guide you to understand how your medical history, how your surgeries, how your chronic illness can play a role um, sort of in your sexual health because it's just a manifestation of your biology. I'm not an expert in every chronic illness. I'm not an expert in every surgery that's been done, but I'm interested and I want to help and I want to find answers. Um, I don't, I try not to make assumptions. I try um, to really engage and ask questions. I, I take lots of notes and I go really slow with people and, and I keep track so I can remember uh, these things. I'm a big um, believer in just long form notes. Um, your past history is super duper important, right? The surgeries that you have, the medications that you take, um, your, um, your social history, right? The relationships that you're in, your past family situations, any prior trauma or stress. Um, I'm a big believer that trauma, and, and for right or wrong, I don't know if I'm right, I don't know if I'm wrong, but I'm a big believer that trauma is in the eye of the beholder. So when you come to see me with a sexual health problem, I'm not jumping to trauma right away, but if you bring it up that you feel that trauma, and trauma can be a lot of things. Trauma can be a speculum exam that goes awry and is really painful. Trauma can be horrific, war zone, gosh, I've heard stories that would, would just, uh, I don't know how people even get out of bed. Um, I've heard such horrific stories, but different things drive different people and different traumas drive different people. So I never assume that trauma is the driver unless you tell me that trauma is the driver or you believe trauma is the driver. And I developed a question that I ask um, and it's just something I came up with and, and, and maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not, but I, I, I say this to my patients. I ask all my patients, I tell them this. I say, I ask all my patients of this, regardless of your gender or problem that you see me for, is there anything cultural, religious, or trauma related that you haven't shared with me today that you want to as part of your story? And the reason I like it, I usually bring that up sort of at the end of our history session um, and getting all the information because I, I, I keep the door open. I don't want you to think that I'm going to just jump into, oh my goodness, you had this trauma in college that must explain everything. Or, you know, sometimes it can, but, but, but not always. So, um, and then whenever I see someone with sexual health concerns, this is where my brain goes. My brain is always thinking this chart and then the next chart, which is the, the, the penis version. Um, I am always thinking, 
about the brain, right? What's going on in your brain? Um, uh, what's going on with the medications that affect your brain, with your health conditions that affect your brain, um, uh, how your relationships are, your cultural upbringing, all of those things, the psychosocial stuff, how your brain interprets everything, it goes through your spinal cord. So if you have sci horrible sciatica and your leg is killing you, but it's a back problem, why can't you have horrible penis pain or delayed orgasm or um, a, a vulvar pain? You can, right? Back, back issues can really present as sexual problems and we see it all the time. Um, so I think about your spinal cord a lot and, and by no means was I taught much about the spinal cord in my urology training. So I'm learning all the time. And then of course I think about the end organ or the pelvis itself. So the vulva, the vagina, the clitoris, the penis, the testicles, the scrotum, you know, how the local area, how so many things can go wrong. And sometimes it's a blessing that anything ever goes right, uh, in my opinion. Um, I think about genitals constantly. Uh, I know it shocks you, a lady urologist thinking about genitals all the time, but I think about them in the fact that they all start from the same place. We all start with the exact same anatomy and you get either a vulva or a penis depending on chromosomes and hormones. And sometimes they can even um, uh, uh, get a, a different shapes and sizes you know, due to problems with hormones and chromosomes. And so I think about this a lot because you can, everything I know about the penis, I try to equate to what do I know about the vulva and vice versa. So I always argue that urologists are uniquely qualified to be sexual medicine doctors because we are trained in taking care of all genders. Um, that doesn't mean we're all good at taking care of all genders, but we are all trained or supposedly trained to take care of all genders. Um, and so the head of the penis is the same as the head of the clitoris. The scrotum is the same as the labia majora. The, op the urethra, the tube that men pee through, is the same as the opening of the of vulva, where actually most pain comes from. If anyone has pain with penetration, it is usually in the tissue at the opening of the vulva. And so um, a lot of things can go wrong here. A lot of disease processes can make things go wrong here. So what do I see in my daily practice? We see tons of libido issues, right? The idea that we can ever get a couple on the same page as when it's a libido or an interest level, that's impossible. If you figure out that, uh, anything that does that, you let me know and we'll, be, we'll make a lot of money together. Um, but libido is, um, and I see everything. I see uh, partners that are, you know, uh, two women where uh, one has much higher libido than the other. I see two men where one's libido is much higher than the other. I see certainly libido mismatch and um, man-woman combos in every which direction. And so libido is a problem when you want it to be better, right? If you say, I have a little libido, Dr. Ruby, but I just don't care. It's totally fine. It's not a medical problem. We don't have to fix it. You're not broken. But if you say, oh, Dr. Rubin, I used to want I mean, I was interested and my partner would initiate. I'd be totally into it. I wanted, it is like a light switch went off and I just don't want anymore. And I'd rather do just about anything else, but I'm bothered by it. Well, people, we got a medical condition and that is something that we can really help with. And we have lots of options. Now, libido is not so obvious all the time. Some people have innate desire where they just want sex. They just suddenly come up with it in their brain. Some people have a responsive desire where they need someone to initiate or need to be watching a sexy movie or something like that. It's all normal. Um, some people have one, then they have the other and they flip back and forth. And the only way it's a medical condition if you're really bothered by it and you want to do something to make it better. I've got tons of wrinkles in my forehead, as you can see here, there are about like three or four different types of botulinum toxin that I could pay lots of money to have put in my forehead so that you don't see all these, I don't know, are these supposed to be terrible or something? I, I'm not bothered by them. So it's not a medical problem, but if you are bothered by your forehead wrinkles, you should be able to go get your you know, Botox injections and not um, have wrinkles in your forehead. So it's all about what, what the patient in front of us wants. And libido is fascinating. It's so fascinating because there's so much at play. We've got, dopamine and testosterone and estrogen and progesterone and endocannabinoids and serotonin. And so some medications are really pro libido and some are really anti libido. And we have to tease that out, you know, to be able to really understand what is happening and is there a biological thing that we can work on. And of course the psychosocial, we can train your brain, right? To be more interested. There is the, just like if you have depression, therapy works, medications work, and guess what? They work better together. And that's true for libido too. We know medications can work. We know sex therapy can work. And I think ultimately we're gonna find out that they do work better together. 
Um, arousal and orgasm, we see tons of problems with arousal and orgasm. And, and again, it, this is complex anatomy. Orgasm is a magical reflex that happens between your clitoris and your brain. And it's almost like a seizure-like activity, right? You get this big, uh, complete uh, contraction of muscles and then this big release and release of tension and a relaxation. Well, if your body is tense up to here already, how are you gonna get to the tense and relaxation mode when you're kind of starting up here? You can't build up. And so sometimes muscles are really contracted with different disease states. And so it's really hard to have an orgasm. You have to have a healthy connection between your clitoris and your brain and through your spinal cord and everything in between. And man, as all of you know, so much can go wrong. And so it's amazing when anyone can have an orgasm as they get older. And so my key is to understand what do we know, what do we not know, and how do we try to improve upon the biology that exists? And similar for uh, penis owners, right? Your orgasm lives um, underneath on the underside of your scrotum. That is typically this nerve where orgasm originates. And so you have to have that perfect connection between your penis and your brain in order to allow for that orgasm. And as you all know, so much can go wrong and it is so hard to talk about, right? But if you break your thumb or you break your nose or you have a bloody nose, you can talk about your bloody nose. But if your vagina is bleeding uh, or you have a, a ejaculate that's bloody, it's really hard to talk about it at brunch time, right? And that's a big problem. So um, just a few more slides. I know um, we, uh, we wanna save lots of time for questions and I'm getting really tired of talking to myself um, and not seeing anybody else's face, but we know, um, we all know there's a pay gap in our country, right? As a woman, I get paid a whole lot less than my male counterparts. Um, that's a fact and a reality. Um, there is a pay gap in this country, but the data shows that we also have a very serious orgasm gap in our country. So uh, people, uh, women can orgasm multiple times. They're actually multi-orgasmic. Um, and yet when a heterosexual woman is in a sexual encounter, uh, she will orgasm every time, only about 66% of the time, whereas a heterosexual man will orgasm about 95% of the time. So it's a little bit better when you have women who have sex with women and men who have sex with men and bisexual men and women, the, da the data is a little bit better, but we have a serious orgasm gap in the country. And so um, our, our women patients, or women are not orgasming every time they have a sexual encounter. They're not always putting their pleasure first or even their pleasure in it at all. And we teach people that sex is just about penis and vagina and man ejaculates, which we all know is a pretty narrow definition of sex and also not really fair, um, especially since women can be multi-orgasmic. So we have to sometimes shift our brains a little bit. And anatomy and physiology can really help us set expectations and get us talking to our partners. Um, you know, I get a lot more guys to quit smoking when I tell them it's really bad for their penis and their erections, more so than it's gonna cause lung cancer, right? That, that sex sells a little bit. That's why we have 151 people on this webinar, which is just absolutely incredible. And gosh, I can't believe anyone goes to webinars anymore in two years into this pandemic. So it is an honor that you are all here. But, but really setting expectations when, you know, the average male orgasm is about five and a half minutes, right? It takes about five and a half minutes on average for a man in, into orgasm. That's everywhere around the world. In the US, it's about seven minutes because USA, right? USA, we're great. Um, but if you ask women, right, it takes them about 14 minutes to orgasm and 17% of people ask never had an orgasm and penetration is certainly not sufficient to have an orgasm for most people. Why? Biology, right? I mean, we can, I could take this picture and show, I show this picture all day long to my male patients, to my female patients. The penis and the clitoris are exactly the same thing. It's made up of the same muscle tissue. It looks the same under the microscope. They're exactly the same thing. So I always tell my male patients, if you rub the inside of your thigh over and over and over again, are you gonna have an orgasm? No, probably not, right? But, but really, like what if you really, uh, really try to have an orgasm are you, know, are you gonna be able to? No, because it's not the penis. It's close to the penis, but it's not the penis. And similarly, if you have a clitoris, right? Here's where, uh, if you're having penetration, here's where penetration happens. It's not, it's like close to the clitoris, right? The vagina's close to the clitoris, but it's not the clitoris. And so we don't, right? It's really hard to have an orgasm with just penetration. And so if we could teach more boys this idea or partners this idea and they understood where orgasm comes from and, and who can enjoy orgasm, um, then we would have better conversations with our partners. Um, I'm a big believer in technology. Um, sex tech 
is really amazing now. And so if you have disabilities, if you have nerve issues, if you have uh, problems achieving orgasm with your partner, there are so many things that uh, vibrate and shoot air and, and uh, just incredible things out, that are out there um, that really do get you to enjoy um, sex time better. You know, it's like not the CD stores that, that had newspaper over them anymore. Like there's high-end, high-tech sexual aid devices now that, that really help just make sex more fun. And remember, that's the goal. It makes, it doesn't have to look like it did when you were 19, but how do we make it more fun? And it shouldn't be painful. There's so, you know, if it's painful, it's not fun for most of you. If it's painful, it's not fun. And so how can you want something and enjoy something? How often do you put your hand on a hot stove, right? You never do it. Why? Because your body's going to protect you. It's going to pull away. You never put your hand on a hot stove. And so if you are having pain, it is very unlikely that you will enjoy sex or have a good time with sex. And so there are so many things that cause pain. In fact, I, I wrote two helped write two chapters in this book um, that my very good friend, Dr. Elise Day, um, uh, published with Mass General Hospital. Um, and it goes into all of the different reasons why pelvic pain can happen and what we can do about it. And there is so much that we can do about it. Um, nerves matter, uh, surgeries matter, and hormones, oh my gosh, hormones matter so much. That vestibule tissue at the opening of the vulva, you see how red and irritated it is here, um, that's hormone sensitive tissue. So if you have no ovaries, if you're on birth control pills, if you are in menopause and you have pain with any sort of penetration or wiping or sitting, it is often a hormonal problem. And, and it's what we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Without hormones in the body, the vulva and vagina get very thin and raw and irritated. And so you have pain with sex and decrease um, lubrication, but it's not just a sex problem actually. It's also a problem with, um, with urination. You get pain with urination. You get urinary frequency and urgency. And the thing that can kill all of you, and I mean this very seriously, is recurrent urinary tract infection. So if you are someone who gets recurrent urinary tract infections, and I will say this blanketly, if you are over the age of 50, now there's some nuance that could be earlier, but if you are over the age of 50 and you have a vulva and a vagina and a bladder and a urethra and you get recurrent urinary tract infections and you are not on vaginal estrogen or vaginal DHEA of some sort, you absolutely should be. And I will convince you of it. You can follow me on social media. I will uh, introduce you to all of my oncology friends, my breast cancer doctor friends, anybody who will listen to me it is the most important thing that you can do for your bladder health, your urethra health, is to be on vaginal estrogen. And it can look as simply as putting a little tablet in the vagina every day for two weeks and then twice a week forever. Um, it, the real question is, you know, when can you stop brushing your teeth? When can you stop wearing your seatbelt? You can't, you gotta do those things forever. And so after 50, your vagina, if it is uh, getting urinary tract infections or is dry, it needs vaginal estrogen forever and ever. And it used to be very unaffordable for a lot of people. And Mark Cuban just came out with a new pharmacy and it's only $10 a month. So God bless America. Sometimes good news does exist. And so it does not cause cancer. It doesn't cause heart disease, dementia. It is totally safe in, I would argue, every patient on earth. Um, and uh, happy to answer any questions about that. So um, once the tissue is healthy with hormones, the muscles that are underneath it can still be kind of tight. Again, remember, you put your hand on a hot stove, your muscles kind of run away. And so when muscles are in pain, they don't like it. So they get tight and they get tense and you get kind of knots in your, in your muscles when they're sore. And so this is where pelvic floor physical therapists come in handy, whether you have prostate surgery or um, uh, pelvic surgery, or you just have pain with sitting, or if you're a Peloton rider, oh my God, those Peloton bikes, they're so good for your heart, but so bad for your genitals. And, and they're really um, crushing those genitals and causing all these penile numbness and things like that. So these are all symptoms that can be cured with pelvic floor physical therapy for any gender. And really, I mean this very seriously, urinary urgency, frequency, hesitancy, constipation, pain with sitting, painful sex, itching, burning, but the skin looks fine, not able to have an orgasm, clothing, tight clothing is hurting you, wiping is hurting you, pelvic floor physical therapist will save your life. So that's all I have for y'all. This is the puzzle that I want you to think about yourselves with. 
please build yourselves a team um, because that is so important. Don't hesitate to reach out to me on social media. That is my website. Um, it is just, I hope you could see these slides. I'm sorry, this was a, a bit of a, a, of a mess. Um, I've never had this happen, um, but I'm happy to spend time answering questions. And I know, um, I know that um, you all have your own stories and your stories really do matter. And so um, any way that we can help answer some of them, I'm really just grateful that you're all here. Could you hear any of that? I hope so. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rubin. That was phenomenal. Okay, great. I got sound now. Yay! Okay, thank you, Dr. Rubin. While we wait for the rest of the panel to unmute and get their videos on, we just want to re-say that the slides will be available on the website after later this week, and this is completely being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube and ANCAN later this week. So don't worry, if there's a lot of information, you can go back and listen to it again. Can you edit out the parts where I fumble and I'm like, I don't know how to share this. I got you, Dr. Rubin. We'll take care of that. Thank you, Alexa. I, I think it makes, it makes it more fun to have that stuff. It makes everyone know we're not perfect. It's fantastic. I'm very, oh, I'm very human, people. That is my that is my superpower, is how human I am. Okay. Dion, do you can you put your camera on, please? Or are you only on telephone today? Kim, why don't you go ahead and introduce the I will others. introduce the panel. Oh, there he is. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I am Kim Stroh. I am the representative for multiple sclerosis. We have Jim. Jim, wave your hand here. Jim is representing the prostate cancer. We have Dion. Dion's here representing his lupus. Sorry, lupus. And then Michael, we don't have the pleasure of seeing him but he's on telephone tonight. So go ahead and say hi to uh, Michael. He is representing testicular cancer. Hey, how are you guys doing? Excellent. Okay, so let's let's start off with a goofy question because you know me, Dr. Rubin, I don't, I don't start out easy. <laughs> okay, so my question is, so I'm thinking about people with carpal tunnel. I'm thinking about people with MS that have muscle weakness, have problem with, um, uh, uh, weak grips and stuff. What is your recommendation for helping give men pleasure with your doing the hand jobs? What is your recommendation? To help I, lo with that? I love that question. And really, um, that's where sex tech becomes so much fun. There are a lot of devices and actually new ones being developed. Um, there is a, a sex tech company that's working on a whole disability line of products that are easier to hold, that are easier to you know, a maneuver, and I think it's so needed and so wonderful, and I'm sure they need a lot of funding because, as you know, there's not a lot of money in sex toys uh, from the NIH. And so, um, uh, devices, um, there are sleeve devices where you can put your penis inside something that feels like a hand job or a blow job, and you press a button and it vibrates and maneuvers and does all sorts of things. And you, it's it's okay if you, I, gosh, I love, I have a, a patient who's 72, and I see her and her husband, and he really likes oral sex. And she's like, Dr. Rubin, I, I've been doing it for years. I'm just not interested anymore. I've got arthritis. My, like, I, I just, I'm not interested. And I said, listen, I get it. You have every right to not give, do oral sex anymore, but he has every right to still like oral sex, right? So this is where using one of those devices can be so wonderful. You can help hold it. You can be there when he uses it. You can just talk about it. Maybe he uses it alone, but you no longer make it weird that you don't want to do those things, right? You can talk about it. And little did she know that I've known for years, he's had those devices and he uses them regularly, but he was never able to talk about it with her. And it was kind of the first opening where she was like, oh, that's a good idea. And now she'll say, honey, what about this device? And he'll say, oh, what a great idea. I'll go buy one, even though he had one already in the, his closet. So um, it really just allows people to talk about it. it. I always say it doesn't matter who's holding the joystick as long as there is joy. Uh, and I think that's key is, is really understanding that pleasure is pleasure. It doesn't matter who is in charge or touching the buttons or doing it. At the end of the day, it's this fun game you're having with each other. Like ice cream doesn't taste better if I'm feeding it to myself or my partner is feeding it to me. It still tastes like ice cream. 
That's my own opinion, though. Maybe I'm wrong. Alexa, did you have an audience question? Yes, I have so many good audience questions. Let's hear them, girl. Yeah, so can you explain when a man loses an erection during foreplay, is it impossible to re to reachieve another erection that evening? It shouldn't be. Um, uh, there's no real biological reason why not. So the penis is um, a muscle, okay? And that muscle is not totally in your control. Just like your bladder muscle, your bowels, it's not totally in your control, right? If you have to go like pee and you gotta go, you can't get there fast enough. It's, it's called smooth muscle. Whereas my bicep, I can tell my bicep to work and to not work. And so um, when your penis is relaxed, right? That relaxed muscle, fills with blood and expands like a sponge. It gets bigger, 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 and harder. If there is anything that contracts the muscle or stresses the muscle, think of it like squeezing water out of a sponge, right? You're just squeezing it out. So say you're having, and don't call it foreplay because I hate the word foreplay. It should just be called sex because everyone's pleasure matters at every point. So when you're having sex and maybe it's not penetration and maybe your mind wanders, right? Maybe you think, oh crap, I have that email I have to send later. Or you think, oh, the kids are like screaming downstairs and this is really challenging. Or your mind wanders, that's adrenaline, right? And when you have adrenaline, guess what adrenaline does? It tightens muscles, right? So you can run away, so you can be stressed. Adrenaline is a stressor. And so that's what happens to your penis. And so the question is, can you get back to the point where you're relaxed? Or is it now that your brain is totally like in stress mode and then you're thinking, oh God, I lost my erection. I'm never gonna get my erection back. My partner's gonna be so mad at me that I can't keep my erection. What kind of man am I? I can't keep an erection. I used to be able to do this when I was 19. That is not sexy. That is not sexy brain work. And so you have to find ways of getting back, of staying aroused, of staying interested. And that's where medications can be really helpful. We can take a muscle relaxer like Viagra or Cialis. You can inject a muscle relaxer directly into, that's how porn stars do it, by the way. I know I'm giving a long answer here, but porn stars inject their penises, which we can teach people how to do. It's a muscle relaxer. That's how they keep erections for two hours. You think with all those lights and cameras and other guys and other gals and everyone in there that they're not stressed out and, and you know in adrenaline mode, they're overriding that adrenaline with the injection. And so we can play with biology to make it work better for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I really appreciate you also sharing that in porn that's what they're using so people don't eat that's that's not typical is what you're saying porn's it's, not real it's not real right it's like learning how to wrestle from the wwf right like it's not real and so you have to understand it's entertainment and also like i showed uh, i told you I, I gave a lecture to high school students today i showed a big picture of a penis with a needle going through it and i said this is porn this is what porn is right don't sit there thinking that two hours is how you're, long you're supposed to last kids right five and a half minutes that's all you get uh, and if you want to pleasure your partner and your partner has a clitoris, it's going to take a whole lot longer than five and a half minutes. And so, and, and if you just stay penetrative, it's never going to happen. So those are the conversations we need to be having is understanding how biology works. What's your next awesome audience question, Alexa? Sure. So how exactly can pelvic floor physical therapy help someone with painful sex? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, there are many reasons why people have pain with sex. I'd say actually three main ones, two that are more most common, which we'll stick to. One is hormone problems, okay? Hormones, hormones, hormones. If you, excuse me, if you play with hormones, there are consequences. Sometimes good, right? Birth control can make you not have babies, which is great during a pandemic. Sometimes bad, um, um, when you have no hormones in menopause, it can make things dry, it can give you hot flashes, night sweats, like, so there's like good and bad things with hormones. And so the vulva is very hormone sensitive. So without hormones, so things that can cause a, 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 an absent hormonal state, menopause, breastfeeding, um, breast cancer medications, birth control pills. There are many things that can cause that tissue to become irritated and painful. That's probably the most common reason we see pain with sex. Super easily treated, super, super easily treated, but you need a doctor who knows what they're talking about. And that's why some of those websites might be helpful. But once you fix the hormone piece, underneath all that tissue is muscle. Right, your pelvis is just a bowl of muscle, and muscle does not like to be in pain. So if that tissue is hurting, your muscles are tight. 
And so what that physical therapist does, and this works for men too, is they get those muscles to relax. And sometimes that means releasing a trigger point or getting the, the tissue to just learn how to breathe and, and kind of massage it out or relax it out. This works for treating urinary urgency, urinary frequency, leakage, um, anything after a prostate cancer surgery where you know you have urgency or stress incontinence. Uh, it's incredible, and, and you've probably all probably heard the word Kegels. Don't do this on your own. No, everybody stinks at doing Kegels. If I tell you to do a Kegel, right? Everyone do a Kegel right now you're all doing it wrong, right? We all are so bad at activating those muscles. And so what the physical therapist can do is they really train you to, to, sometimes you need to strengthen the muscles, sometimes you need to relax the muscles, sometimes you need to do both. And so you have to see a professional. And they're miracle workers. Don't you agree, Kim? Yes. So if you guys missed the urological uh, webinar that Dr. Rubens and I did in November, I she was we were talking about issues I was having, and she recommended me to go see a pelvic floor physical therapist, and, and I did, and it actually improved my symptoms by 80 percent. Highly recommend. I was able to go out of the country for vacation earlier this month. No issues, no fear. I live pretty normal. So I was super excited. So they're not just for the ladies, though. They're also for men. So don't think that, you know, but if you're having any problems with your logical issues, get that pelvic floor physical therapist referral. Super important. You will thank Dr. Rubin. And you listened. I mean, I'm not even your doctor and you listened to me. It's so exciting. I hear good advice. I like to take it. <laughs> okay. Who else has a question? I do, but I don't want to take advantage of my position. No. To, and ask the question. That's what we want you to do. Okay, you burn this, you burn this position. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a two-part question. And maybe it'll, it'll relate to some guys with prostate cancer. When I got a prostatectomy, um, I was advised to try to um, work on my continence while I still could because I was quickly referred to adjuvant radiation. And they said, once your radiation starts, your continence will probably stay where it is. Well, it wasn't good at all. And I went to a pelvic floor specialist and I did pelvic floor exercises rigorously and it did not improve. And when I had the radiation, it continued to not improve. And it was heavy enough that I finally, after some consulting with urologists, got an artificial urinary sphincter, which has been a godsend. That's been wonderful. Yes, that's but awesome. But at the same time, um, my my function, as I was talking about before the show, I never mind saying this now because it's not true anymore. I had I had great function. I had mm -hmm. stellar function for years. Mm -hmm. Sex was wonderful. I had plenty of it. I had no problems. Very unselfconscious. I was very blessed. I had great partners. Everything was wonderful. Once I got the prostatectomy, I started to get some function back in the three months between the function the, between that and when the clinical trial started, which not, included not only radiation, but of course, uh, ADT, hormone therapy and some Zytiga. And because my function had barely started to come back, as soon as I started the ADT, like happens for many men, my libido went completely to zero. The testosterone itself went below 10 and my libido, libido went with it. And I had heard and knew that I had to do rehab, I had to get a pump, I had to get, work the pills, I had to use it or lose it. But to be honest, I don't know if I have, was overconfident that it would come back no matter what I did or if I just simply didn't have any interest, because I didn't. And I always joke that for me to work on my penis at that point with absolutely no desire whatsoever was like clean the bathroom. I had no interest in it whatsoever. So I would just forget about it. And by the time I remembered, I'd say, I'll get to it later. I went a whole year, the year that I was on ADT and the six months afterward, my testosterone was frankly still below cash rate level. I had no, I didn't touch it. Now I'm done with treatment. My testosterone has come back. My libido is, you know, it's come back some, but uh, of course, because of the prostatectomy, maybe my penis, penis is shorter, it's thinner. It doesn't get hard anymore very much. When it does, it doesn't get all the way hard. So I, that's where I'm sitting now. And even though I've been trying to work on it, it's a little bit better. It comes out now. You know, it's it's out. It's not like a, it's not like any belly button anymore. It's come back to that. But that's that's as far as I've gotten. And I would love to uh, to regain function. My wife is sort of waiting for me to see what I can get. She doesn't want to. She doesn't have any expectations. 
but she feels like she wants to wait until I'm ready. And I feel like if I wait until I'm really ready, then I'll just be dead. And I'm only 66 and I'm in great shape. So, so yeah, so, so there is so, so much that we can do. Have you, have you looked at injections? Have you tried injections? I haven't. I have a urologist and I asked him about injections last time that we met and he said, let's hold off and see what happens when your testosterone remains at a normal level for a little while. Right, we'll, talk, we'll, we'll talk offline. The answer is injections are always the right answer, especially when it comes to rehab in, in terms of taking your brain out of it a little bit. And 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 Jim, yeah. what I will say, I, I'm very aggressive when it comes to penile rehab and, and doing the work and keeping things going. And it's hard. And I will tell you, Jim, you now understand something that most men do not understand, and that's menopause. Okay, you understand menopause from a very deep and empathetic level that no man on earth really truly understands. That idea of castrate levels of hormones and how terrible it feels. The hot flashes, the night sweats, the shitty sleep, the depression, the anxiety, the total lack of libido. Dr. Rubin, I would rather take the garbage out than you know have, have sex. Can I just but interrupt to say that all of those things did not affect me very much except for the loss of libido only because I overcompensated with a, excuse the expression, shit ton of exercise. Which is so fabulous. But so that knocked out everything else, but not the loss of libido. But not, so so the answer is, um, yeah, so it's real, right? Biology is real and biology will get you. And when you understand the biology then, um, and I have a number of patients with metastatic prostate cancer who I love being their quality of life doctor where you've got your cancer doctor, you've got your clinical trial doctor, you've got your, I have a patient right now who I love dearly, who his PSA is going up. He's already had radiation. His, uh, you know, he's getting his, his scan and he emails me to keep me a part of the team, a part of the loop and says, we need to talk about this because I'm there every step of the way with, okay, how are we enjoying life? We're keeping life going. So what are we going to do to enjoy it? What is the plan? And you're going to go like this, right? There's going to be moments where you want to focus on it and moments where you just want to do anything else. And the key is, is having somebody, a doctor like me, who's going to be there with the ideas and the toolbox to say, Jim, come on, let's get the injections going because who knows when the testosterone comes back, maybe you'll regain some function on your own. It's back, it's back now. It's fully back. Right. But I, mean, I want to, you know, I, I don't know if, you know, I could get a recurrence. And in the time that I'm riding high and my testosterone's returned, and I feel great overall. I don't want to waste this time with my, uh, my non even, even more of a reason to get injections going because that gets the muscle relaxed. It overrides it. You need to learn them two years ago, not just uh, tomorrow. But, you know, that's really, you, you have to advocate for yourself and you have to understand um many urologists are not sexual medicine trained, right? They don't have sex on their mind all the time, the way some of us do, um, in the sense of that is my goal. My goal is how can we improve your quality of life? And I'm super aggressive about it, but I have to get to know you to know how we need to be aggressive on your behalf, right? Because different I'll, people- I'll We can stop right there because I'm gonna, I was gonna consult with you. There are the last three messages that I left from my urologist had not been returned. So it's a perfect time to, Throw him straight under the bus. God bless his soul. So. And we do, you know, medicine, I will say, and I will be honest, is medicine's really broken. And especially like with pandemic, um, that no doctor wants to spend only 10 minutes with you. No doctor wants to get paid $120 from your insurance company, you know, for really complex conversations and answering all the emails that don't get, re you know, that don't get uh, reimbursed. It's, it's so broken. You deserve good care. You deserve time. You deserve people to really get to know you and to love you like your family. And medicine is just not set up to succeed in that way. And so sometimes you have to find, you have to know that not each doctor is gonna fit every box. You got your cancer doctor, you've got your sex, sexual health doctor, maybe you have your physical therapist, maybe you got your sex therapist, maybe you've got, and so, and you're not gonna need all of them at every moment of your life, but to know that you deserve those things and that there are people like me who will advocate on your behalf and try to encourage you to get those things, um, is really important. And thank you for sharing all of that with us, Jim, because it's not easy to say those things. And you have helped so many people on this call. You have no idea. I mean, really, really helped because talking about this stuff is not easy. Well, you're welcome. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Looking forward to it. So, Dion, Michael, Lexa, do you guys have a question? I actually just wanted to share a thought um, about just going back to the injections. I'm on injections um, and will be for the rest of my life. Uh, but 
they are by far the best thing that has probably happened to me post kid. I mean, we've tried so many different things. I was on Amber Gel. It was terrible. I don't recommend it. Uh, well, you're on <laughs> we're talking, we're talking, we're actually talking penis erection injections, not testosterone injections, but both are excellent. Oh, just, yeah. But yeah, testosterone injections are fabulous. That's yeah. awesome to hear. I'm so yeah. glad you found something that's working. Dion, any any words? Oh, you're oh. muted, Dion. Now he's frozen. Dr. Rubin, I actually have a question from the audience we can go ahead and take. So what is the difference between arousal and, and stimulation? So arousal on the male side, if you have a penis, arousal is like an erection, right? That's what, when we talk about arousal, we mean erection. So on the, on the clitoris side, if you have arousal, it's similar, it's an erection, it's an engorgement of blood, right? The, the, the clitoris and the penis are the same thing. It's just, you, you, it's all internal. So you don't really see it get erect, but it's that feeling of swelling, engorgement, um, sort of the tinglies that you get down below. Now we fight among our, we're very nerdy in our science fighting, but there are fights about is arousal all genital or is there some form of cognitive arousal mm -hmm. where your brain is kind of like feeling aroused and feeling it, which is a little different than interest and it's very subtle, but there is argued that there is cognitive arousal, but also actual genital arousal. So even if your stuff's not working, sometimes your brain can still feel that arousal and still kind of get in, in the mood. And so a lot of people will add lubricant um, which lube, here's the, here's the skinny on lube, okay? Lubricant works is great. So if you take people with no sexual health problems and they're normal, they feel fine, they don't complain of anything, and you throw lube in their sex life, guess what you're going to do? Woo! Are they going to have a party? You're going to make sex so much more fun, even though they had no problems. Now sex is like way better. If you take someone who has pain, who has dryness, who has irritation, who has hip pain, who has back pain, who's got all these things, and you add lube, it's like a drop in the bucket. It'll help a little bit, but you're not curing nothing, right? And so really you got to, lube is always good. It's always the right answer, but it's never typically the only answer. And so if you go to the doctor to say, hey, I've got vaginal dryness and they just say, here's some lubricant, say, no, no, no. I learned better from Dr. Rubin that there is other stuff that I can do to actually fix the problem. Dion, can we hear you now? No, we can't hear you. Um, so another question that we have is about the injections, about the penile injections. Um, for someone who hasn't had them before, do they hurt? Does it, is it a cost benefit ratio of, does this hurt so bad that I don't wanna do it? Or is it better than what someone would think? It's so much better than you think. Um, it is a tiny, tiny needle. It's like a diabetic needle. You can barely see it. I, actually, I wish I were in my office and I could show you what they look like, but it is a tiny needle. If you take a, your thumb nail and you kind of just pinch your, pinch your skin for a second, that's about as bad as it is. Um, you, you build it up into your head a lot worse than it actually is. Um, it's, it's not difficult to do. It's not difficult to learn. It's, it's, very low on the to nothing on the pain scale and it becomes like a muscle right we can all learn to do new things it's something new that you can learn how to do and um it can be life-changing for people when you struggle to have the erections your own erections and you can bypass your brain and your spinal cord and your cancer diagnosis and just get your penis to engorge it can be just really really uh, wonderful for couples so and the feedback you, own. the real world feedback you hear from your own patients, even if they have some apprehension, is that the injections do contribute to quality of life. In incredibly, yes. Mm -hmm. And how would a man or anyone else go about asking their doctor for that? Because we have a lot of people in the prostate cancer community who might see this webinar and go, this, is, this sounds great, I'm interested. How do you start that conversation? So all urologists are capable of providing injections. It's very run of the mill general urology, but as you can see, that wasn't Jim's experience with his general urologist. And so typically within a practice, that's why I gave that SMSNA website, because if you wanna find a doctor 
who specializes in sexual health. The Sexual Medicine Society of North America is the top tier place to go to find us. Um, if, but even with providers that aren't on that website, you can still usually find someone in the practice. Sometimes it's a nurse practitioner. Sometimes it's a, you know, someone who, who has decided that that is the practice that I want. You know, they don't make a lot of money teaching people injections. They make money putting in penile implants, which are also great options if, if injections don't work. And so really finding the person in the practice who cares about this and will sit with you and teach it to you, it can be a, absolutely um, wonderful. Thank you. And I'm so curious because I'm an AYA myself. Um, I'm a adolescent young adult and so is Michael who we have on the phone. Michael, I know that you and I both have different sexual concerns than maybe some of our older peers. Do you have anything to add to that? Um, not necessarily question, wait, can you all hear me? Okay, cool. I want to make sure I was I was being heard. My fault. Um, I think for me, honestly, you know, I think a lot of my concerns um, were more, um, you know, since I am on testosterone injections, I think mine were more centered around since I wasn't able to be on the medication for two years due to, you know, no health insurance. Um, <clears throat> mine were, it was kind of centered around like, how do you get pleasure? How do you you know have a good sexual experience when you literally feel you know i this might sound silly but the, the way i kind of felt was you know we're, we're more in health class and we put on those drunk goggles you know during the lesson about like drunk driving and stuff that's kind of how i felt for two years you know just almost like in a haze and a fog and um i'm back on injections now thank god um because like i just i feel so much better and you know i still have my days obviously but i mean that was really my main concern and Michael, what I will say is um, if you ever find yourself without health insurance, again, um, testosterone injections are dirt cheap and hopefully you are paying dirt cheap for them. You can, without insurance, you can get the cash price of injections for like 40 bucks to last you like nine months. Um, it is uh, anyone who charges a lot of money for testosterone injections is um, overcharging. And so you can get cash price medications quite, same with Viagra and Cialis, they're both ge generic. And so you can go to goodrx.com, which is a website, and you can see all the, the cash prices for some of these drugs. Um, and you go to your pharmacy and say, here's my prescription for my doctor. Here's the coupon. Don't run this through my insurance. It's way too much money with my deductible and my copay. And you pay you know, very little money. And so I always joke, people pay a lot of money to come to see me for me to then give them uh, the, the best deals on all the <laughs> medications that nobody, nobody ever spends the time to really teach them and show them. And guys are spending tons of money on the internet for their testosterone injections. I mean, like thousands and thousands of dollars um, a year uh, to text with a doctor to get testosterone injections when it's like 40 bucks a year. It's, it's pretty, um, there's a lot of badness in the world, but it's pretty crazy. Yeah, no and Michael, one of the things is, is that we've had so many questions about people asking about dating. And I know you personally, because because we're good friends, but you had that, you had a similar experience to having to disclose to someone when you're dating that you've had cancer and a lot of cancer treatments, no matter what your diagnosis, cause sexual dysfunction issues. Even in thyroid cancer, we struggle a lot with vaginal dryness and sometimes erection issues. So can you talk a little bit about that because our audience wanted to know? Yeah, so basically, um, you know, for me, uh, it was, a lot of trial and error, <laughs> I guess. You know, it, it's it's honestly, I think it's about most of all, I think it's a it's about feeling okay with yourself and finally coming to terms with, hey, you know what, I, I'm not gonna, you know, regardless of how my partner reacts, you know, if it's a if it's a if it's a good experience or if it's a bad experience, I've got to be okay with who I am as a person, and you know, be able to move on from it. And you know, and honestly, and it honestly took a long time. I'm going into year 12 now of survivorship. So it took a long time for me to get to that point because, you know, there's so many, for me, it was bad enough that I struggled with my image and how I, you know, thought I looked to people when I was going through it. But I think, you know, once you go into survivorship, I think it's a, it's a whole different animal. It's a whole different ball game because, you know, now it's suddenly like, now what? 
And, you know, and being that I've struggled with the whole getting my testosterone on a normal, uh, on a normal scale for 12 years. Um, and, you know, it's, I'd like to think it's, it's going to be normal for the rest of my life, but you know, it's, it, there's possible it could fluctuate. And so, you know, I think from, and you know, uh, I am dating somebody now, I do have a girlfriend and, you know, it took, uh, it took a long time for me to, again, get to that point to where I could tell her. And once I did tell her, you know, it was just like uh, the world, the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders. And so, you know, I think bottom line, you just have to be okay with yourself. And it, regardless of how they react, it's it's going to be okay. I mean, you're going to find that person that that will be okay with it. And, you know, it's going to be okay with everything that comes with. I, I mean, for me, you know, it's being okay with the mood swings, the, the PTSD that I experience. Um, just all the emotions and all everything, um, especially all the side effects that come with the testosterone, I found <laughs> to be an alpha for two years. Uh, but you know, just just finding um, it's 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 a really it's a beautiful thing, honestly. Once you do find it, you got to go on the road I, with that because if you're not shouting that from social media and from every human that will listen to you, because you have so much to teach kids and adults, frankly, and grandparents and everybody about, um, you know, you, what I often say of my young patients who have uh, challenges, right, whether it's cancer challenges or sexual health challenges early on, and I ache for them, and it is absolutely horrible. But in many ways, y'all are way have way more fun in life and more fun sex than my 70 year old patients who have been doing it the same way every time, you know, for 30 years and haven't questioned it. And then some, something happens and they get, you know, problems. And so it, it allows you to communicate better than most humans know how to communicate and to be comfortable in your own skin in a way that some people take, maybe never get, uh, but some people take many, many years to get. So while I hate this happened to you and I hate um, that you've had to go through this and had to deal with the, the adversities and the challenges that you have, how many people you are going to help by watching how you have come on the other side and, and, and advocated for yourself. It's really a beautiful thing. And yeah, at the risk of I just want to say publicly, I, I want to co-sign what Michael said, but you are not your diagnosis code. You are worthy of love, great sex, and everything that comes with it and comes with the relationship if that's what you want. And it has nothing to do with the diagnosis code. You are so much more than that. And I just I just want to say that for everyone to hear. And it's it's so true. I mean, and think of what advice you'd give to your friends, right? If you have a soldier coming back from Iraq who got a blown uh, uh, genitals from an IED, does that soldier deserve good sex and good intimacy and good relationships? Absolutely, right? Does someone in a wheelchair deserve all of the good sex? And of course, does someone with extra weight, does everyone deserves pleasure, intimacy, quality of life? And so how we can help you get there, right? You fundamentally deserve those things. And you don't have to look like, you know, you, you don't have to look like Brad Pitt in order to think that you deserve those things. And um, and it really is, it's so important. And, and Alexa, it's such a wonderful point. And if I could add one more quick thing, um, it's, it's, it'll be quick, I promise. Um, I just wanted to say like to every, and I know, you know, for men, it's a lot harder to share your story, but don't be afraid to share. I mean, obviously share what you are comfortable with, but don't, you know, I'm an open book. So, but I mean, for you, you know, share with, with what's comfortable to you, but don't be afraid to share it. You never know who you are going to impact and, you know, who, who you may just by sharing your story, who you're going to give that kind of nudge to come forward with, with their story. Dion, do we have sound? No. Okay. I'm going to ask a question. You need to type your question in the box, Dion, because I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. I'm going to go back to our thing in November because I think this is an excellent question to ask. So I asked you last November, I said, hey, my doctor prescribed some Balta for me for my pain and numbness in my foot and my leg with MS. One of the side effects I had was even though I'm female, I was essentially chemically castrated because my libido died. So the question is, what medications should we be aware of that can affect our libido? That they're supposed to be treating something else, and then we're like, suddenly, I have no desire. 
There's a lot. Um, um, and what I would say is the most common ones tend to be certain antidepressants. Uh, remember, serotonin can be negative to sexual function, um, dopamine positive. So anytime we can boost dopamine and decrease serotonin, but if you're depressed and you can't get out of bed and you feel awful, then yes, curing your depression or treating your depression with an antidepressant can be life-saving and good for your libido. So that's why it's it's not a one size fits all of Cymbalta always bad. I have patients where Cymbalta has been wonderful for their libidos because it has helped their pain so much and their libidos are much better. Um, and so it really becomes seeing a specialist who, or, or just you working with your doctors to say, hey, can we go over my medication list? And I really do feel that there's been a change. And so anything that has to do with your brain can affect it. Anything that has to do with nerves, remember, nerves are important for you to experience, you know, um, all the sensations that you want to have, and anything that has to do with hormones. So if you're on uh, spironolactone for acne, if you're on birth control pills, if you're on androgen deprivation therapy, if you're on tamoxifen or anastrozole, you know, all of those medications can, don't always, but can really screw up uh, some sexual functioning. And so that doesn't mean that you should go off that medication and say to hell with it, I, I don't want to do it. It means having a, a, a real conversation with your providers about, because sometimes we can switch, sometimes we can add, sometimes we subtract, sometimes we tinker, um, but it matters. And if it, don't just think, okay, this is cancer, so I have to be on this or else. Um, your life, your quality of life really does matter. And so we sometimes do have to make adjustments. Now, Viagra has been out for 24 years, since 1998. Is there a female Viagra out there for us ladies? It's a great question. So um, I have three answers for you. Um, there are two FDA approved medications for low libido in women, and they actually work great on men too. And they boost dopamine in your brain. So one is called Addy. Uh, it's a bedtime pill that you take at night and it boosts dopamine. Um, and it works in about 60% of patients I give it to of all genders, and it gets you a really good night's sleep. There's some weight loss with it and boosts dopamine in your brain. Um, there's another medicine called Vilesi, which is an injector. So you inject it in your thigh or your stomach. It doesn't hurt. It's a little bit of an auto injector and it gives you a boost of dopamine. And so you do it like an hour before you want to want. So say you're going on date night or you're, you want, you're going on vacation and you really want to get that boost of dopamine. You can do sort of that on demand medication. Is it as powerful as Viagra in the sense of works on, you know, such a high percentage and boom, it's going to give you an erection. No, this, those medications work on your brain. Um, now, I would argue that I said I had three answers. So that was two. Um, vaginal estrogen, if you are over 50 or uh, have dryness and have pain and have you know, a hormone reason, if you go on vaginal hormones that are local and not dangerous and good for everybody, it can be as good as Viagra in the sense of your body responds, it arouses, it lubricates, and it's life-saving. It makes sex no longer painful. It makes urinary tract infections disappear. Um, it is life-changing. In fact, I will tell anyone and everyone who will listen to me, and I was walking out of high school, where I went to high school today, and, and some teacher was like, oh, I heard you gave a good talk. Man, I, you know, someone, what are you, you're a urologist? Someone told me I need to see one because I get urinary tract infections. What did I say? I said, how old are you? She said, 56. I said, you need vaginal estrogen. Here, watch this 12 minute video of me talking about it and you'll understand why you're getting urinary tract infection. It took me five minutes in a hallway, right? Like, um, uh, and I didn't charge a, a copay for that one. So it, it's really, really important and maybe just as good as Viagra for women. You know, I, I, I want to say something, Dr. Rubin, because it's so interesting. And you're talking about injections, you know, and uh, in the same way, weirdly to me, that people, some some people, the main reasons that people didn't get a COVID vaccine. One of them that you wouldn't even think of is that you simply are afraid of getting injected. They, they, will, they will sacrifice everything because they don't want to get injected with a needle that's a lot bigger than the insulin needle for the injection. But there's a lot of men who I understand would say, you can't, no, yeah, I'm not gonna, no. Crazy you know? lady, you want me crazy, to stick what, crazy. where, what do you and think? Yet, if you're familiar with the insulin needle, which I am, it, it's, I'm not a diabetic, but I know that it's, it's, it's nothing. And your characterization of it is, you can pinch yourself and have the same effect is true. And I tie that in with the artificial sphincter because I had such relentless incontinence. And I've communicated with a couple of guys who did also, I had climacteria, which boy, that, that is no good. My wife said, get back to me when you- Tell, people, uh, tell uh, people what climacteria is, Jim. That's when you ejaculate urine when you, when you uh, have orgasm. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in my case, you know, porn stars, but 
except for the substance had nothing on me when it came to the that was just crazy mm -hmm. but as i uh got to the point where my wife said well get back to me when you solve that and also the, the you know the changing of the pads all day long the relentless and constant so when i talk to guys later and say the aus really 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 solved my issue and it's so great they say yeah but it's a surgery I can't do it because it's another surgery and I can't do it because they have to be replaced every seven to 10 years. And all I can say is if you've had the kind of incontinence I had, that doesn't bother you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would be ideal if it was something better, but it's so much better than what I had. It was the only answer to my problem. And, and if getting an injection in my penis, uh, it helps me. Um, we, we should not fear. I guess you, you know what you said. We should not fear a diabetic needle when we really have no idea of how nothing burger it really is and that's really where it becomes so important to have a good relationship with your doctor because i have to know you enough to say jim come on this is fine let's just try it come to the office we'll show you how it works we'll teach you how to do it and then you go home and you say oh my god i can't do this you say come back to the office let's show you again let's give you the confidence let's let's make this happen but at the end of the day if you cannot be near needles and your partner doesn't want to do it right that's another option is a penile implant just like you had an aus you can put silicone balloons in that penis that will pump uh, and inflate and deflate, and it's world changing for patients when they just want a reliable erection when they want it. But again, you gotta also remember where are these erections going? And so if you have a partner who is 60 and has dryness and pain and menopausal changes, it's really important that we take care of your partner as well. Is the sensation uh, still there as much mm -hmm. in an implant? Yeah. Yep, in my mind, it's like having a strap on dildo and you can't feel a thing. But it not at be. all. So, so nope, it's a very great point. So you don't feel, and I've never had a penis, but you don't feel the engorgement, that that filling feeling. The sensation on the skin of your penis is totally intact. Your orgasm is totally intact. If you ejaculate, which you do not because of your prostate surgery, you still would ejaculate. And so what you're missing, you know, there's, there's, it's not perfect. It's still a, you know, um, when if you, you made a good point, you said, because um, I was on androgen deprivation therapy, things are shorter and thinner now than they were. And so really um, the, we size the implant directly for you. And so if you took your penis and you stretched it as far out as you possibly can, that's the size you're getting and so some guys are growers instead of showers and so they get a little bit short changed in how much they feel that they're getting in there but when you have a guy who hasn't had a great erection in how many years because of all these things it's yeah. life it is life-changing for for patients when they that get to the point that's so good to know because i was i, I was i had big big penis when I was erect and very small when it was not right so i would lose there you but I won for, for the first 50 years of my life. So, yeah. so there's a there's an answer to it. And that's where the that's where the mindset shift goes, right? Like just because it's not exactly the same penis that you had when you were 19 doesn't mean it still can't function and drive a few more times, uh, you know, and, and you deserve those things. Great. Okay. Dr. Rubin, me... could you quickly state the medications for women again? Yeah, there's three. Well, three that I talked about. One is Addy, A D D Y I, Addy. It's a, a little pill you take it every night at bedtime. It helps you sleep and um, helps improve your libido. There's another one called Vilesi, V-Y-L-E-E-S-I. Yeah, V-Y-L-E-E-S-I, Vilesi. That's the injection that you take an hour before you want that hit of dopamine. And the third is vaginal estrogen. So any form of local vaginal estrogen, it could be a cream, it could be an insert. And if you ever want to know all the details, just look at my pinned tweet on Twitter and you'll get everything that you need on that one. Okay, I have what Deanne wrote. So give me a second, I have to scroll and then another part. So he said, just want to make a quick statement because I talk a lot of loot. Uh, talk a lot with lupus patients we sometimes struggle with the mental portion sexually because mentally we want to but our bodies don't allow us to be able to have all the energy we need at times to be able to have sex but at times it's frustrating because once i get mentally frustrated it makes it hard to stay focused i really appreciate the men who tell their story that's what advocacy is all about in the autoimmune community and there's another part so give me just a second uh uh, uh, having lupus, your partner must be very understanding and caring as well. So that's why a lot of people in the lupus community are single, uh, 
due to relationship issues a lot, having a partner who really doesn't understand lupus. Uh, so the first part that he talked about was fatigue, huge issue with MS. I have that issue. So maybe you can talk about some of the things that Dion mentioned. Yeah, and thank you for telling your story. I think that's such a great and important point of lupus affects your whole body, right? MS affects your whole body and every single cell in your body is affected by this horrid condition. And so finding a doctor who understands every single piece of how this is affecting your body is nearly impossible. And it's effing frustrating, excuse my language, of having to show up to doctors and having to be your advocate, own advocate and, and really try to get your point across. And it's a huge problem with chronic illnesses, whether it's lupus, MS, Ehlers-Danlos, and pain conditions, chronic fatigue, um, gosh, to, to endometriosis. I mean, too often we are not heard, we are not listened to, and we have to become our own advocates and, and science hasn't caught up with our knowledge. And so, um, don't give up is what I would say. And I know it's easy to give up sometimes, but um, we have to tease out and find the things that do feel good and find the things that you do enjoy and find the parts of you that are working. And when they are working, let's optimize them. And also to allow, that's where the working as a team in getting you to do the mindset work that you can to realize that you are so valuable and you deserve partnership and intimacy and love and all of those things like you inherently deserve them and don't ever think that you don't deserve them but it you have to really work at finding the people in your circle the people in your life and and gosh you gotta sometimes kiss a lot of frogs before you find that uh uh you know the right person but they're worth wait they're worth fighting for and also self-love right this idea that pleasure and self-intimacy and self-love you if you love yourself and you really value yourself, then you will be more open to finding that partner and finding that person who um, kind of in the place where you least expect them, right? Then you won't even realize that you found them. So um, I don't have any wise, any wisdom other than to say thank you for sharing your story. And by doing these things, you are going to help so many people. And then my, my last quick question here before we wrap it up is, do you have any recommendations for people that have body weakness, paralysis, we're talking wheelchair users, what to do for uh, comfortable body positions, not being able to hold up their bodies, things like that? It's a great question as well. And I won't say that I'm the absolute expert, but I know people who are, and I, I use my friends all the time to help me when I have questions. Um, it depends on the person, the position, the thing that, what sensation that you do have. Um, I had one of my favorite veterans come in who um, uh, was a quad, is a quadriplegic and came in on a stretcher, has no sensation from the neck down. And he said, doc, he wears a condom catheter to urinate. And he said, he said, Ruben, I want a penile implant. And I said, that is a great idea. He said, I want to have, you know, penetration with my partner. I love my partner. We have a great relationship. I said, that's a great idea. And so we put in a, the penile implant that is just rods where you put in sort of a bendable penile implant. You don't have to inflate or deflate. You don't need a dexterity. And he can now wear his condom catheter very easily because it sticks straight up. And so it stays in place. Whereas anyone who's worn a condom catheter knows that they're awful and they fall off all the time. And then he could now have penetration with his partner, which was important to him. Now he doesn't have sensation anymore but it was valuable for him and it was a wonderful surgery and a wonderful outcome um, now when it comes to um, wheelchairs and positions and things like that again high vibration can help a lot of people cervical stimulation can help a lot of people um, there's some very interesting data that shows women who have our spinal cord injury patients can still orgasm and the thought is because of the vagus nerve is somehow a, a part of a cervical innervation and so even though you have no sensation below sometimes you can stimulate an orgasm uh, similarly with certain high vibration points you can potentially get auto ejaculation and things like that and so um, positions they also in addition to making awesome devices out there they make amazing things like pillows and chairs and um, other sexual aid devices that are totally different than what you know the CD sex stores of yonder years uh, you know are out um, and so you gotta explore um, there's a friend of mine who has a, a program called ergo erotics which is all about the ergonomics of sex and so if you do if you do um, uh, need a hip replacement, right? How do you have sex? Or you got a new knee, you know, you still deserve sex. And what does it look like? And how can you make it more comfortable? And, and so um, 
in the disability community, we have a long way to go in terms of giving quality and uh, equal care and, and really uh, diving deeply. And so um, my hope is that it just keeps getting better and better. Dr. Rubin, I have a really quick question that actually, because I have a feeling a lot of our prostate cancer men are going to want their wives to watch this because of what you said about uh, the, the vaginal estrogen, because it's, it's just such good information to have. But we got a really good question I'd like you to answer. If a woman does vaginal estrogen, can it affect her, her partner's cancer treatment, especially if they're in a hormonal related cancer like prostate cancer? I love that question uh, more than you could ever know. Um, so when a woman puts a vaginal cream inside of her of estrogen, um, that woman, so let's say she's not on any other hormones and she puts in a vaginal cream. If we draw her blood, her estrogen levels at zero pretty much. It's pretty much zero um, and it stays zero when she puts in that vaginal cream or vaginal tablet. Um, her partner, if she's a male partner, if we draw his blood, um, his estrogen is about 25. That's pretty normal. Um, now, when you use testosterone blockers and things like that, it might go lower than that, but it's not usually zero. In fact, estrogen is really good for men, for their libidos, uh, for their bones, for their brains. And so men are kind of walking around with an estrogen of 25 and women over 50 are walking around with an estrogen of zero. Um, me, my estrogen is probably between 50 and 300, depending on where I am in my cycle. When I was pregnant with my monster children, um, my estrogen was about 3000. Um, so we can get really high, right? Um, so using a dab of cream, a little, you know, using some cream internally, if it gets on the penis skin, it's not going to absorb to any levels that are going to shoot the estrogen up for any prolonged period of time, it's going to be a drop in the bucket. And so totally safe to do. Um, if it bothers you and you're concerned, just put the cream in after you have activities and do it later. It's only usually a twice a week medication. So depending on how active you are, um, there are certainly workarounds. Thank you. I think that uh, that's such a good question to ask. And especially when you are on hormonal treatment. Thank you. I love these questions. We have 117 people still on this thing. This is like amazing. Rick, look what you build. This was your brainchild. Rick, you are muted. You're muted, Rick. I'm here. Oh, we love you so much, Dr. Yes. Rick. When are you coming back? When are you coming back? Oh my gosh, I will come back. The more questions, the better. I, I This has just been really wonderful. And again, I, all I can say is we don't know everything. We have so much to learn. The idea that I can understand, I, I love this panel so much because we've got uh, MS and lupus and cancer and prostate cancer and testicular cancer and thyroid cancer and uh, every, and guess what? all of you have are going to have issues and all of you are going to age thankfully with modern medicine we're going to keep getting you guys older and things are going to keep going downhill and keep having challenges and keep having problems but we keep getting advocacy and education and research and and whatever we can do and whatever i can do to shout from the rooftops that this matters this freaking matters and and um and so i'm just grateful to be invited and to be a part of this 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 amazing family that I, I learned about just, you know, not too long ago. And, and really, um, we got a lot of work to do and we need your voices because advocacy and your voices is literally everything. And so we absolutely, whatever you're doing, do it louder, uh, do it more aggressively, do it to your neighbors, to your friends. Uh, I told you I got vaginal estrogen for a, someone I never met in the hallway of my high school just today. So whatever we can do to advocate and just say sexual health is just health. That's all it is, and it matters, and you should be able to talk about it like you talk about your lupus treatments or your prostate cancer treatments or your MS treatments, and it should just roll off your tongue just as easily. And so we have a lot of work to do to get there. What I want to say um, is that, because Dr. Rubin won't say it, um, because it's, it's, it wouldn't be professional, but I want to tell you all that Dr. Rubin has just gone out on her own in a new practice in DC. I don't know if she does telemedicine, but I suspect she does. And if you weren't impressed by tonight, I don't know what will impress you, but um, we will, I, I hope Alexa has Dr. Rubin's um, link, her URL, 
If not, maybe Dr. Rubin will put it in. Somebody will put it in. Reach out to her. She's the best. Uh, oh, as Jimmy's you know already word. found out. Jim's Wait. already going to see her after talking to her tonight. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's I'm, done a deal. In. New so patient, new say, client. I will say part of, you know, I um, starting a new business and uh, starting it from scratch and doing it in three months' time, it is a very, I should be proud of a lot of things that I have done, you know, parenthood and surgical residency and being in med school and all of those things, but I'm truly proud of being able to just start something from scratch and, and make it my own. And, and it's challenging. There's no good way to do medicine and I'm not going to fix the medical, the broken medical system. And so I've made choices of, I want to spend time with you um, and I, I need to be able to hire people who will also want to fight for you and advocate for you and, mm -hmm. and, um, and build your teams. And so um, I've had to make some, some really difficult choices in building the practice, but I am so thrilled for what it is going to be and what it, it continues to be. And, and also knowing that my dream is also to do things like this and to talk and to yell and to advocate and to talk to anyone who will listen. And so, and, you know, eventually raise money to get more research and more funding and more fellows and more trainees. And um, I'm, I'm slowly building an army if I can. Um, so happy to see anyone. We got a bit of a wait list right now that we're going to uh, start to, I'm just one person. And so um, I wish I could say I have a well-oiled machine going right now, but if you're patient with me, um, we're going to find ways to see people and see them um, as, as quickly as possible, but also as slow as possible, because they like to take a lot. There are only so many hours in the day, and I still like to see my children occasionally. So please reach out. The best thing you can do is follow me on social media. Um, when I do events like this and things like that, again, I want you to have a voice and to get question answers. Um, and if I can be of any help to you, just as I said, thank you so much for having me. This was such an honor. Um. I just, in my eagerness, I just sent out a link to everybody that was only supposed to go to the panel. So please forgive me. This is not, that link is not for the entire audience. Forgive me, forgive me. What I was trying to do was send Dr. Rubin's link to the entire audience, which uh, we will do right now. Um, I but I, I, I really, um, I really do want to thank you so much, Rachel. I mean, this is, just um it's been a fantastic session and we had this idea that we didn't have to have you come back just to ms we could have you come back and talk to a whole bunch of different people because they all need you and um and and they saw it tonight and we will do it again and we'll, we'll figure out a way to do it again um and i just want to thank the audience for being here um We've got all kinds of ANCAN groups. Just go to ANCAN.org and you'll find a group hopefully that works for you. And if you don't find a group that works for you, you let us know and we'll try and put together a group that works for you. Um, we've got some exciting news. We've got we've got a pancreatic cancer group starting, um, we hope, in February. We've got a chronic pain group starting very soon. I'm hoping we've got a lupus group, Dion, starting very, very soon. So. Um, we're expanding and we'll bring you the best, just just like Dr. Rubin. I'm gonna hand it over to um, Alexa because she may have a couple of close out messages. Alexa, you're on. Hi, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who contributed to this conversation. Sexual health is help and we health and we have to stop the stigma about it. And thank you so much, Dr. Rubin for being so open and honest and sharing this experience with us. And you know, in healthcare, there's so many things we can improve upon, especially for patients. But I know that with all of us together, including the, our audience who were so brave and so bold asking these questions, that we can improve it together. So I look forward to working with everyone and creating a better system that works for all of us. This was recorded and you will be sent a link. We will also have the slides up very soon. You will find it in our blog. Go to ancan.org slash blog. And thank you so much for coming.